Good afternoon, evening, morning, middle of the night, whatever it happens to be where you're at, and welcome, as I am going to read for you The Buffalo Bird Girl by S.D. Nelson. This earth is alive and has a soul or spirit, just as you have a spirit. Other things have spirits. The sun, clouds, trees, beasts, birds. Missouri River, Buffalo Bird Girl's grandfather. I was born in an earth lodge by the mouth of the Knife River in what is now North Dakota, three years after the smallpox winter. My name is Buffalo Bird Woman, Wahini, and my people are known as the Hidatsa. When I was young, they called me Buffalo Bird Girl, after the little brown bird that lives on the prairies of the Great Plains. This name has brought me fortune, for buffalo have a strong heart, and the birds of the air have a good spirit. In my life, I have seen beautiful things, and I have lived through hard times. When I was six years old, a terrible sickness called smallpox set upon my people with a fury. The cruel disease first appeared on the Great Plains many years before my birth. It arrived with the coming of the white men. They did not bring the sickness on purpose, but Indians could not fight off this disease. They had no immunity to the dreaded evil spirit. Smallpox passed some by, but sadly, it took the lives of many Hidatsa people, including my mother, my brother, and one of my aunts. My grandmother and two aunts survived. They raised me with the same love and kindness as my real mother. We lived in a village of Earth Mound Lodges on the high bluffs of the Missouri River. We called it like a fishhook village, for it was built upon a sharp bend. One side of our settlement was protected by the mighty river. The other side faced the vast open prairie and was fenced off with stout posts, a stockade for protection from enemy tribes. The aggressive Lakota Indians in particular were constantly trying to steal our horses, our supplies of corn, and other belongings. Our village was the home of two different Indian tribes, the Hidatsa and the Mandan. We had formed an alliance in order to increase our strength in numbers, so we would be less vulnerable to attack. Like a fishhood village was in the center of much activity, with people constantly coming and going. It was cool inside, never hot and stuffy. My family's earth mound lodge was large, measuring more than 40 feet in diameter. It needed to be, for it was home to my father, grandmother, brothers and sisters, cousins and uncles and aunts, 12 people in all. Inside, four enormous cottonwood posts stood like trees. They supported timber crossbeams that carried the great weight of the packed earth. There was a fire pit in the center with a smoke hole in the roof above. In the shadows beyond the four posts were more columns. They held the log rafters and the leaning walls. Various household items and baskets of dried corn and squash hung from the poles set across the rafters. Bed frames ringed the interior. Each served as a bed as well as a place to sit. The bed posts were draped with old TP coverings for privacy. This canopy also kept out drafts. At night, everyone slept on buffalo robes. For three seasons of the year, this is where we lived, and I considered it my permanent home. Here I learned many of the duties expected of a Hidatsa woman. Work began early every day. I remember awakening to the comforting sound of a crackling morning fire. My grandmother and aunts would already be awake, preparing breakfast. I learned by watching and then by doing. A favorite breakfast for us children was hot corn porridge. To make it, grandmother would pound hard kernels of corn into a fine meal in a wooden mortar. She boiled dried squash and beans in a clay pot filled with river water. Then she added the cornmeal mixed with roasted buffalo fat to the pot of vegetables. It tasted delicious. We women and girls always ate in a separate area from the men and boys. In the spring, when green buds appeared on the gooseberry bushes, we knew the time for planting had arrived. Families from each earth lodge had their own garden. The women and girls did the farming. We planted corn, squash, beans, and sunflowers in the rich soil of the lowlands nearby. 
There were several varieties of corn, yellow, white, and red. We used digging sticks and iron hose to loosen the earth and get rid of the weeds. My grandmother used a hoe made of bone from a buffalo shoulder blade attached to a stick. We thought that the corn plants had souls, as children have souls. From spring to harvest, my younger sister and I would sit atop a platform, keeping careful watch over our cornfields. Hungry crows, gophers, and horses were a constant threat. They needed to be chased away. Prowling boys from the village liked to sneak among the rows of corn, too, and steal cobs. We would yell their names when we saw them and threaten to tell their mothers. Corn plants have a spirit, as do all living things. Even clouds, stars, and the rocks of the earth are part of the one great spirit. We girls who kept watch often sang songs to the corn. We sang in the same way a mother sings to her young child. We believed the corn plants enjoyed listening to our songs. The men did the hunting. They sought buffalo, antelope, deer, and other large animals. The boys hunted small animals such as rabbits and birds, such as grouse and ducks. Removing the hides or skinning was a task we all shared. The women would prepare to cook the fresh meat for everyone to enjoy. They would slice up the remaining meat and dry it on racks outdoors. Rising smoke from the fire helped cure and preserve the meat so it would last a long time. The women also scraped and tanned the animal hides. They used the prepared skins to make clothing and teepees. Like other tribes on the prairies, we needed teepees whenever we traveled. The women even made the bull boats used for river travel out of bent willow saplings and rawhide. All of these things I learned by watching and then doing. Friendly tribes such as the Crow and Shoshone regularly visited our village. They traded horses for our corn. White fur traders came into our country too, seeking animal furs, especially buffalo hides. For these, they would trade us supplies that we desired. They built a trading post near our village and called it Fort Berthold. It was exciting to see steamboats come up river and unload items to trade. To us, the white man's goods, kettles, guns, metal knives, iron hose, and sugar were wonderful new luxuries. Sometimes I was allowed to go into the fort. There I would see colored glass beads, metal cooking pots, and colored fabric, as well as the different people, missionaries, settlers, gold seekers, and soldiers. Their strange hats and clothing with buttons seemed marvelous. Even the language they spoke while bartering was a curiosity. Hidatsa and Mandan men began hunting buffalo for trade. They killed more than I imagined possible. At the trading post, buffalo hides were heaped into piles like mountains. We received goods such as metal tools, rope, and coffee, and the men were even given liquor. We were told that the hides were sent downriver, then back east to be processed into leather goods. I look back upon my girlhood as the happiest time of my life. In our farming community, there was often extra time for fun. The boys played games that tested physical skill. They shot arrows, wrestled, and raced horses. We girls were not allowed to play with the boys. Instead, we played house with dolls, kickball, and my favorite game, hide toss. In hide toss, a group of girls held onto the edges of a large buffalo hide and used it to take turns tossing one another in the air. The goal was to see who could fly the highest while standing and keeping her balance the longest. Show-offs would twist from side to side as they bounced into the air, turning a full circle in two bounds. I could hardly wait for my turn, as I would fly as high as the others and flutter kick my feet. At the height of each bounce, my stomach would feel as if it was turning upside down. We would shriek and laugh until we were exhausted. During the summer season, we picked ripe berries and dug prairie turnips. The gathering of firewood needed to be done year-round. The job was less difficult with the help of our family dogs. My dog's name was Sheepisha, or Blackie. I raised him from a puppy and remember wrapping him in a blanket and carrying him on my back the way a mother carries her baby. When he was old enough and strong enough, he joined the other family dogs in hauling firewood. Just as my grandmother had taught me, I rigged my dog with a harness two long poles, and a cross frame called a travoy. We had to travel quite some distance with our dogs in order to reach the wooded areas along the river. Men would accompany us to watch for enemies. Once there, we chopped dry tree limbs and driftwood with iron head hatchets. 
We tied armloads of firewood onto our dog's travoy, but never more than a strong dog could pull. Often upon returning, I would reward Shapisha with an extra chunk of meat. Suddenly there came a sound, poo, 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 as of guns, and a woman screamed. One summer the Lakota attacked in broad daylight. Thirty mounted men came yelping over the ridge, poo, 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 and they fired their guns. The horse thieves had come for more than just corn. They wanted slave women and children too. My sister and I shrieked and we ran from our platform in our cornfield. Other women and children ran crying toward the village. Painted Lakota horsemen with an eagle feathered headdress galloped along the edge of our cornfield. A young Hidatsa guard named Red Hand was ready and charged his horse to meet the enemy. The Lakota launched an arrow into the air. The shaft struck Red Hand's horse in the neck and it fell beneath him. But brave Red Hand landed on his feet. He raised his rifle, took steady aim, and fired. Immediately, the Lakota brute slumped forward and dropped his bow. His pony turned in retreat. Yelping Hidatsa and Mandan warriors seemed to appear from everywhere to repulse the attack. The Lakota quickly realized that they were greatly outnumbered. They had no choice but to flee. Our warriors gave chase. After nightfall, our men returned. They rode into the village, triumphant victors with war stories and the scalp of one unfortunate Lakota. It was the custom. Our women built the great fire for the celebration. Everyone painted their faces black and joined in the traditional scalp dance. It was a joyous party that lasted late into the night. And then came the corn harvest, busiest and happiest time of all the year. With the attack behind us, the women and girls had to attend to harvesting the crops. First, we gathered the squash. We sliced each vegetable into sections, pierced them with rods or spits, and hung them on racks in the sun to dry. The corn which had ripened on the stalks was ready for harvesting next. Later, we would gather the beans and sunflower seeds. The women and girls from each lodge collected their ears of corn in baskets and heaped them near the center of their individual gardens. There was so much corn that the men and boys would help with the husking. We peeled back the husk and braided the corn together into bundles. Each bundle of braided corn held about 50 ears and was heavy. The bundles were hung on the rails of a framework known as the drying stage. Small ears of husk corn were not braided together. Instead, people carried them in baskets to the drying stage and spread them to cure in the sun. The corn had to be completely dry before being placed in storage, otherwise it would spoil. The women and older girls separated the dried kernels from the small, loose cobs in a process called threshing. The threshing was done in a tent beneath this drying stage. The women beat the corn with sticks, knocking the kernels from the cobs. The walls of the tent kept the flying kernels from bouncing away. Then we gathered the beans and sunflower seeds. After the harvest, in preparation for the next year's crop, the women set aside plenty of extra ears of corn. The best kernels from these cobs would be the seeds for next spring's planting. We saved the ripest and best colored seeds from our squash, beans, and sunflowers as well. We hung some of the bundles of braided corn in the family lodge for immediate use. We also kept some sacks of threshed corn, but much of our dried corn, squash, and beans was stored in underground chambers called caches. My grandmother taught me how to use a buffalo shoulder blade like a shovel to hollow out an underground cavity. The pit would be deeper than a man is tall. A ladder was needed to climb in and out. We would line the walls with dry grass and then fill the pit with corn and other dried crops. When the cache was full, the opening was covered with dry grass and hidden beneath dirt. Robbers would have a hard time finding the buried treasure. The contents would be dug up whenever needed. Some caches were dug into the floor of lodges, but most were outdoors. In this way, dried corn, beans, and squash lasted throughout the winter. We had plenty to eat when the prairies were covered in snow. With a little okra and buffalo fat, I painted my cheeks bright red. As the days grew shorter and the nights turned cold, I would actually smell the change of seasons. The cottonwood trees transformed from green into gold. A successful harvest meant giving thanks to the Great Spirit and celebrating. On such occasions, I would wear my finest beaded dress. 
We women and girls would braid our hair and apply makeup to our faces. At night, drumming and singing rose from the village. We all took turns at dancing, many with painted faces and in handsome costumes. The scene was magnificent. Men and women always danced separately. Likewise, boys and girls did not dance together. We all wore winter moccasins, fur-lined with high tops. Winter on the Great Plains could be merciless. For this reason, my people did not live upon the exposed banks of the Missouri River year-round. The river iced over and remained frozen like rocks for months. With the onset of the cold winter months, we vacated like a fishhook village and moved into the wooded lowlands. Everyone in the village packed up the stores of food and other belongings. We lashed everything in bundles onto Travoy, which were pulled by horses and dogs. The bottom lands were thick with trees and offered some protection from the brutal blizzards that howled across the prairie. There was also a better supply of firewood. Each winter we selected a new location to build our temporary winter lodges. When our food supplies ran low, some of our people returned to like a fishhook village to gather corn and dried vegetables we had buried in the storage caches. This way, we were never hungry. And so I grew up a happy, contented Indian girl. With the end of each winter, the sun traveled higher in the sky and warmed the earth. The thick ice on the Missouri River began to thaw and break up. Migrating geese flew northward in great waves that filled the sky. Their thrilling song assured us the spring was coming. All the Hidatsa and Mandan people knew that it was time to return to like a fishhook village. Our world was constantly changing. Raids from the warring Lakota tribe continued. Steamboats arrived frequently during the summer, bringing more white men to our village. Another tribe, known as the Arakara, decided they would not survive alone. Smallpox and the warring Lakota had taken too many of their lives. We welcomed them into like a fishhook village. In spite of outside pressures, we continued to live close to our mother earth and to follow her ways. We watched and listened for the changing of the seasons. I am an old woman now. The buffaloes and black-tailed deer are gone and our Indian ways are almost gone. Sometimes I find it hard to believe that I ever lived them. Like a fishhook village is gone now. There are no buffalo left to hunt and the fur trade ended long ago. The government of the United States said my people had to move from our village. They promised to provide rations of food and clothing if we lived on a reservation. The government built roads, schools, and churches. They told us that our children had to learn to live the white man's way. So we Hidatsa, as well as the Mandan and Arakara people, gave up our round earth lodges and began living in square cabins on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation. But I have not forgotten our old ways. In the shadows, I seem again to see our Indian village with smoke curling upward from the earth's lodges. With the passing of winter, our days grow warm. Green buds appear on the gooseberry bushes, signaling the arrival of spring and the time for planting. Not far from my square house, there is an open space for a garden. The seeds that have been carefully stored through the long winter are brought forth. My old hands can still loosen the earth with a hoe and set kernels in the black soil. Inside each seed sleeps the spirit of life, waiting to sprout. In my memories of long ago, I hear two girls singing, my sister and I. We are singing to the corn in the same way a loving mother sings to her child. And in the moist earth, unseen, there comes a gentle stirring of new life.